the last three Sundays, we've been talking about the subject of repentance. And I hope to finish that message today. Repent. The very first word out of the mouth of John the Baptist as he came preaching was this word repent. And then when Jesus came, uh, the one that John had come to, to be the forerunner for, his first message was repent, repent. And we said that repentance, it means what? What, what do we say repentance means? It was a little test here. To, to change your thinking, to change your mind. We usually think of repentance uh, along the idea of apologizing or saying I'm very sorry. And it may include that, but the reason that it includes that is that our thinking has changed. If I don't think I'm wrong about something, I'm not going to apologize for it. If I'm doing what I think is right, uh, no matter who says you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm not going to repent because repentance starts at the core level, not the external level. And a person can say I'm sorry, not be sorry at all. When my cousin, who was just 10 days younger than me, when, when he and I were little boys, we'd get into fights. And uh, our mothers would uh, be upset with us for fighting. And they would get us together and say, okay, we well, want you to hug each other and tell each other you're sorry. And so I would get my arm around his neck and I would squeeze it real hard and I'd say, you're sorry. <laughs> and my mother would say, no, that's not what I meant. I mean, you, know, I, you, you tell him that you're sorry. And I would say, I'm sorry. That I can't choke you, you know, or something like that. So I was saying the right words, but I wasn't sorry at all. And so repentance is not just an, an outward act. It's not just an external acknowledgement that I've done something wrong. Real repentance starts deep, deep down, and it affects what I think. And so this morning, uh, I want to, uh, I want to just tell you. 12 things that should shape the thinking of every Christian. These are 12 things that shape my thinking. These are the things I've asked over the last few weeks. What are the bedrock truths? What are the things that I have changed my mind about? And I believe this. And the first thing, we've already mentioned some of these, that, that there is a God. That there is a true and a living God. And that this God created the world. So the Bible says in Psalm 14, 1, the fool, only a fool says in his heart, there's no God. I mean, anybody with any sense, anybody can just look at the stars and look at, the, uh, look at their hand and look in the mirror and see themselves. Anybody, they can see a baby being born and say there's no God. He's just, they're a fool. I, that's not my word. It's God's word. My mother never would let me call anybody a fool. Apparently she never heard me call anybody a fool. But, uh, but God has the right. And he says that a person who says there's no God is a fool. So the first thing that drives my life is I believe there is a God. And I believe that that God is a personal God who created all things that exist. And I believe that he spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And, and he just spoke the whole universe into existence. And I believe this God has revealed himself. We talked about how he revealed himself in nature. He revealed himself in the, the, the prophets. He revealed himself in Christ. In fact, uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 11, verse 1 says that God... God spoke in many, chapter 1, verse 1 says, God spoke in many, many ways in times past, but in these last days, he has spoken clearly and finally through his son. So Jesus is the highest revelation. But then God has also given us a book. He has given us a revealed truth about himself. God spoke through 40 different authors over uh, 2,000 years and inspiring and breathing in them his very breath and his very word. And they, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, they wrote down 
the things that God told them to write down. And so listen, to me, the reason I am who I am, the reason I believe like I believe, the reason that I'm offensive to some people is because I believe that what God says in his word is the truth. God's word is truth. If I didn't believe that, then I could just go off and my opinion would be just as worth as much as your opinion. And by the way, my opinion is worth as much as your opinion. Neither one of them are worth anything. All that really matters is what saith the, the Lord. What does God say? What does the Bible say? So I believe that God is the only true God and he has spoken to us and he has established absolute truth. Absolute truth. Now that's something that people don't believe in today. I have many, many young people say to me, uh, there is no such thing as absolute truth. And I say, are you sure about that? They say, yes. And I say, so you're, you're absolutely sure that there is no absolute truth. And then if they've got any sense, they realize that they've painted themselves in a corner. Because if they say yes, then I say, so you'd say that's an absolute truth. And they, well, I, I just, you know, they don't know where to go from there. But there is absolute truth, but it's not their truth. People talk about, well, that's your truth, my truth. No, there is no my truth and your truth. There is God's truth. And God has clearly told us some things. He has spoken clearly about morality. He's told us what is right and what is wrong. What is immoral and what is moral? God has spoken clearly. He's spoken clearly about gender. I feel, I deeply feel sorry for any young person or adult person who is a male, but they think they're a female. Or they want to be a female. Or a female who clearly is a female, but they really want to be a male. I, I, I do. I feel sorry for them. I, I have. A, I don't mean sorry for them just in a sense of poor, poor them. But I mean, my heart goes out to them because they didn't. Many of them didn't choose to get into that kind of gender dysphoria. They were. They were mistrained growing up. Sometimes I think it's because of uh, of some genetic uh, malfunction. In their body. We know that some people are born physically with deformity. I believe some people are born with some emotional deformity, spiritual deformity. All of us born with spiritual deformity, and some are born with maybe a gender deformity. But that doesn't change what God says. And, uh, and God is clear about marriage. Marriage is to be between a man and a woman. And again, I have many friends who are gay. I, and, and, and they're good friends. They love me, and I love them. And uh, uh, we, we're, we're good friends. We can pray together, and we can, uh, can, can talk about spiritual things together. We can agree on a lot of things. But I have to say to them, when they say, I want to be married, but I want to marry someone of my same gender. I have to say to them, you can't do that. You cannot do that and without violating what God says in his word. The Bible teaches very clearly that a man who lies with another man is committing sin. And so I can, I can have a, a sense of sympathy for them, but I can never say well, it's okay. If that's the way you feel, it's okay. Let me tell you, truth does not care about our feelings. If that was the truth, then I might never repent of anything. I might say, well, well in fact, the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man. It's just not right. God says the end of that way leads to destruction and to death. 
And while I can befriend and can pray with and can sympathize with, can share the gospel with a person who disagrees with what God says about a variety of things, I cannot change my mind about what God says because God's word is truth. That's a good place for an amen. Amen? All right. Let's try it again. God's word is truth. Amen. amen. All right. And, uh, and then, I mean, and really everything, how to parent, how, how to be a husband, how to be a wife, uh, how to handle our finances. God speaks to all of those things. And that's the reason we're told to study the word. To study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. We have to know what God says. My brother and I are notorious about getting something that has a thousand pieces in it and just the first thing we do is pull out the instructions and look how thick they were and we just pitch them over to one side. And we look at the picture on the box and we try to put that gym set together or we try to put whatever together and we try to try, try to and we'd end up with a bunch of pieces left over. I thought, well, they sent us a bunch of extra pieces. No, they didn't send any extra pieces. They just sent pieces that we didn't use because we didn't read the directions. Well, I tell you, there are a lot of people that just, they look at life and they say, well, I'm just going to try to put my life together. And God says, no, here are the instructions. Here's the way it's to be lived. And if we don't live it that way, we end up with a mess and it doesn't hold up so there is absolute truth and then the sixth thing if you're counting is that life is precious human life is precious God created Adam and Eve in his own image and all human life is precious and again uh, in the Bible if a man uh, pushed a woman or injured a woman she was carrying a baby, and she lost that baby. He was convicted of murder. And I, I'm just telling you, uh, God is the author of life. And a lot of people say, well, what about unplanned pregnancies? Well, unplanned from whose perspective? My wife was an unplanned baby. But I'm sure glad God planned her because they're a happy husband and three grown children and ten grandchildren and six great-grandchildren that wouldn't be here if God hadn't planned for her to be here. So when somebody comes to me and says, well, I, I'm pregnant, but I don't want this baby, I say, well, I don't know why you wouldn't, but no matter why you wouldn't, there are some people who want that baby. There are people who are praying for a baby, longing for a baby. Their arms are empty. They want a baby. Have this baby and let somebody have this baby who will love the baby. If you, if you can't, I won't pray to So life is precious. We looked at, at that passage. And here are the the last six, and I'll go through these very quick because I need to go. All of us are sinners. All men are sinners. Look at Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. Romans 3, 10 through 18. The Bible says there is none righteous. No, not one. None righteous. No, not one. And verse 11. No one understands. No one seeks for God. You know, people say, well, aren't all people, all these different ways, they're all looking for the same God. No, nobody's looking for God. God seeks us. We don't seek Him. We seek something to soothe our conscience. We seek something to help us uh, make sense of the world, but we're not seeking the true and living God. God seeks us. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. 
Not even one. No one does good. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. That's especially true today. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Listen, what I'm saying is that I'm no better than the worst person on the planet. A friend of mine who pastors out in Oregon now used to say, I have, I'm much more uh, like Charles Manson than I am Jesus Christ. That's the truth, folks. By nature, we are much more related to the worst of the worst than we are to the perfect holiness of the Son of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory, glory of God. That's why all people need a Savior. And our culture, this is number eight, our culture is headed for what the Bible calls the days of Noah. The days of Noah. Listen to Matthew 24, verses 37 and 38. Jesus talking about when the Son of Man was going to return to this earth. And he says, For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the army. You might say, well, what is eating and drinking and marrying and giving you what, what's so wrong with that? The idea is there was no thought of God in their mind. They were going about their daily business, doing their everyday, everyday thing without any acknowledgement of God, who he was, what his role was, his authority in their life. And the Bible tells us back in Genesis that the imaginations of their mind were only evil continually. It's all they thought about was selfishness and evil and even cruelty. Number nine, God has provided one way of forgiveness and salvation. Many verses we can look at here, but Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says it very clearly in many, many other verses. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But Acts chapter 4 verse 12 there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So if, if you think, well, maybe there's some other way to get to God and some other way to get to heaven, you need to repent. Change your thinking. Because God says, no, there is one way. And Jesus is that way. There is no other name. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And then, just quickly, everyone will be judged. Everyone will stand before God, either as a forgiven sinner or as a condemned sinner. Everybody. Everybody will stand either covered with the forgiving blood of Jesus Christ or facing the wrath of a holy God. And then number 11, heaven is a real place. Heaven is real. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Well, I love Randy Alcorn's book on heaven. Man, I read that book. I love that book so much. I almost quit wearing my seatbelt. It just made me so eager to go to heaven. I tell you what, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. Someday we'll see our Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. And I look, I look forward to going to heaven. Uh, and as I, as I was praying last night for Susan, I was thinking my heart was so heavy for her family. But at the same time, I just couldn't, I couldn't in any way feel sorry for her. Because I think just watching her yesterday, in that helpless, hopeless state and to know that 
maybe even in the last few minutes and certainly in the next few minutes, she will take that last breath and then open her eyes and she's there to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. And uh, so heaven is a wonderful place. But I want to tell you, there's another place too. It's not a wonderful place. Hell is a real place. And I know it's uh, not politically correct today. And I know there are people who would outlaw it as cruel and unusual punishment. But I tell you what, when you think about creatures that have been given life by a perfect, holy, wonderful God and have been shown that he's real and they rebel against him. That is high treason, folks. And even in political terms, treason requires extreme penalty, the death penalty. And to be treasonous against such a wonderful, loving, powerful, holy God, nothing other than absolute eternal punishment would fit that crime. And every sin, every sin will be punished. Every sinner will be punished. Our sins will either be punished on the cross in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago or they'll be punished eternally in the fires of hell. So, heaven is a wonderful place, but hell is just as real. And then the final thing, eternity is forever. Eternity is forever. My brother and I were talking years ago about praying for some lost people, some sinners, and some family members that we knew that were not Christians. And my brother said, you know, Nick, I would be willing to go to hell if we name these people. If they could be saved, I'd be willing to go to hell if it only lasted a million years. If I knew that I could go to hell for our brother, for our father, whoever, and I have to be in hell for a million years in order for them to be saved. I'd be willing to do that because I would know there's an end out there somewhere. But to think about going forever and ever and ever and ever, I couldn't do that. And I said through my tears, I said, Don. I know your heart. I know your compassion. And I know you would be willing to do that. But two things are wrong with it. Number one, you could not take their wrath. You couldn't. And the second thing that's wrong with it is that Jesus already has taken their wrath. And I can't die for any sin. Jesus died for sinners. So these are the things that drive my life, drive my thought patterns, shape my value system, shape my theological perspective. And uh, maybe Lord willing, I'll give you, I'll give you that list next Sunday. I'll print it out and give it to you next Sunday because I think it's shared by most all of us. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. I ask you now in the name of Jesus to shape our minds according to your truth. And I know we live in a time when there's so many voices, I mean so much, dozens of hours every week we're hearing false information. We're hearing error. And I just pray that you'll help us to run away from it, to, to turn from it. As your word says, incline my ear to hear your truth. Father, 
our ears are so often open to error. And that error shapes our thinking, that thinking shapes our values, our values then shape our behavior in our life. Incline our hearts, incline our ears to hear you in Jesus' name. We're going to sing an invitation hymn first, and then I'll turn the service over to Stephanie and Tracy. I'll let them lead you in our worship time. But if you need to come this morning, if you say, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to repent. I want my mind to be shaped by these kinds of truths, the Word of God, and I come. You come as we stand together. As we stand. <clears throat> Some of these songs I don't think that we should sing sitting down. So let's sing, we're going to sing Praise to the Lord the Almighty to start our worship.
this week. Now more than ever, we need to come together and pray. And there needs to be a revival because God's purpose to send his son was to just save us. And so let's pray for those who don't know that yet because Jesus still saves. I'm going to read Psalm 23 out of the New Living Translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams, and he renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You welcome me as a guest, anointing my head with oil, and my cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever.